Hello and welcome to the FEZ Show. It is the 30th of July 2020 and we have a lot to discuss today as we edge closer to the first of six races in Berlin. We are less than a week away now. So, first we have to talk about some tragic news that came from the circuit yesterday. Obviously there was a death, a tragic accident of a construction worker who died yesterday in a forklift accident. First, I want to just say, obviously, Yes, Formula Re, it has happened at a Formula E event, even though it's a pre-build up to the event, but we can't really blame Formula E in this sense, because obviously they would have had contractors um, in. We can't blame them either. Um, it's just a tragic accident that's happened, a, a forklift accident that's happened, which has caused someone to um, to have lost their lives, which is which is a terrible shame. And obviously everyone here at Formula E Zone, we send their condolences to their family and, and to the people affected by the accident. It's obviously... Um, it's such a shame, but it just highlights that even, you know, motorsport, it's a risk building an event just as much as sometimes the drivers, you know, racing an event. And I think people forget that. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to learn from this form, or you might be able to learn from this to see what happens so it doesn't happen at any future events. Hopefully that construction company also learns what happened so that everyone can be safe effectively because that's what we want it's such it's it was horrible and and kind of sickening to read that you know what was coming out yesterday so as we said we wish everyone um you know the best who have who have been involved with it um so yeah so that's what we're going to say on the topic obviously it's truly sad we've got so much obviously to look forward to in this show and to talk about but boys edward hunter and jack pickering are here with me morning boys how are you yeah not bad jack Hey, Jack. Yeah, I agree completely with what you've said, actually, about uh, yesterday's events. You know, we all know it says on the back of every ticket, motorsport is dangerous, but we never really stopped, like you say, we never really stopped to think about the contribution of uh, track workers. In my opinion, it would be really nice if we got to have a, a minute silence on the grid uh, next week uh, for the, you know, fallen track worker, but um, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. But yeah, like you say, it's very surreal, it's very sad, and uh, hopefully we have got some other good news to discuss as well, but uh, it's definitely something that I think it's right that we touch upon. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Ed. Um, it's, I really hope that Formula E obviously do a minute silence or, or something just to commemorate the person, because obviously it did happen building their event, so it would be really nice just to, you know, just to make that touching remark and to show, you know, yes, this has happened and we respect everyone, not just the drivers, not just the teams, but everybody who is involved. That comes from the construction workers who, you know, build the event and then have to take it down in three days, obviously, to make everything go back to normal. Uh, and that's a tough job. And, you know, maybe in those circumstances, when you're doing it so quickly, things like health and safety can be overlooked. And I'm not saying it has been ever. I'm not ever saying that. But um, and it may be in this case, health and safety wasn't overlooked. It was just something that terribly happened. Like no details have been revealed from it. So we just don't know. So I think a, a mark of respect would be absolutely amazing for it. But in terms of Formula E, moving on to Formula E, moving on to happier pastures. Um, there's so much to discuss and, and some breaking news actually, Jack, coming out of um, this coming this morning was James Collado. Um, potentially missing the final two races um, in Berlin to go off to WEC, to go to Spa and race in um, the World Endurance Championship at the Spa four hours, I think it is, or maybe six, can't remember off the top of my head. Um, this weekend, what was your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, it came as um, uh, uh, it came as a bit of a surprise this um, uh, this morning because uh, honestly, I, I only heard it when we were starting to when 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 we were joining before we um. Uh, but uh, before we started going on air, but no, it was um, it uh, it, yeah, it was a big surprise. Um, I do understand why James Collado is doing it because he is um, I think he's fear the fifty one Ferrari, which is fighting for the title. So um, yeah, no, that makes sense for uh for, for him to skip the final two days because it because he won't be. Oh, well, I I'd, I'd be very surprised if he's fighting for the title. Um, come come the come the final two races of the season so yeah no it makes sense and yes there are a lot of other WEC drivers that are in Formula E but they won't be um, they won't be as uh, uh, they won't be as prominent in WEC as they are in Formula E because they're further towards the top of the field obviously yes one of them would have been Brendan Hartley 
But as we've already discussed, he has already been replaced at Dragon by Sergio Seto Camara. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, 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 I do completely understand why he's done it. Um, but yeah, no, I believe the big rumor is Tom Blancfist. Uh, it's going to be in that seat. Um, which makes me uh, a, a little bit happy. Where's my Swedish flag? There we go. He's <laughs> British, but his dad's Swedish. There we go. Um, so yeah, no, um, but, uh, I'm 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 happy by that. Makes up for Joel Eriksson, but uh, but yeah, um, yeah. No. Yeah, I think Ed though it was, it's interesting for me. I feel like this is a little bit well, you're replacing me, Jaguar. So I'm gonna leave anyway. Um, and and obviously you bring up Brendan Hartley there as well. You know, this could have played havoc because obviously he's part of the Toyota LMP1 team. You know, if he was leaving anyway and he's got a clash potentially now, I say a clash, right? The race is on the weekend, right? Because if you think, you know, we've got Antonio Felix da Costa, championship leader, that is technically missing practice. You've got Nick De Vries in the Mercedes, who's in the LMP2 car, um, miss, well, you know, driving for Mercedes. Buemi also in that Toyota car, which obviously Brennan Hartley would have been racing, for example, um, is, you know, it would be missing that day. So I feel like this is kind of like a, well, you're getting rid of me, so I don't mind skipping the last two races. Um, from James Collado. I definitely feel that there might be an element of that um, between Hartley and the Dragon team. I think with Collado, it looked to me like Ferrari were just uh, putting their foot down on their contract, saying that we're doing practice on the 13th, which is the same day as the basically the fifth of the six races, I think, uh, uh, August 13th. And they, they say that, we, oh, you, you have a contract, James, you have to be there. And then Jagger released a statement saying, no, um, James is going to be in Berlin, actually. Uh, but, but even if he isn't, we have a contingency plan, effectively. And that's what uh, where Tom Bonkhurst, of course, who did do a couple of races in season four for Andretti. Uh, so he has a bit of formal experience. And that's where he comes in, uh, in that scenario. It's a little unfortunate. I think Tom Bonkhurst is a good driver. It's, it's a shame he's never really got a proper full season drive because Andretti kept swapping around that second seat that year. But... Um, but yeah, it's it's a little unfortunate with the with the clash it's, with everything starting up again at sort of roughly the same time. I guess it was kind of unavoidable uh, in a way. But um, but yeah, it's um, it, it, I I definitely don't read it as a Collado putting two fingers up to Jaguar. I think he definitely maybe consider trying to keep that door open as a sort of test or reserve going forward. So if there's you know ever an opportunity somewhere else in Formula, he can come back. I think I don't think he's given up on it. Uh, formally completely just yet even though he's going to lose that seat for season seven i think it's quite interesting jack that you know it was reported that jaguar were offering james collado that reserve driver role and we don't know if he's accepted that we don't know if he's accepted we don't know if he's turned that down because if he hadn't accepted because they've signed because apparently they have signed tom blonquist as a reserve driver now i don't think tom blonquist you know, would have wanted a reserve role that only lasted one weekend. Like, he probably might have pushed for at least being the reserve driver, you know, going into season seven. Um, so I, I think, you know, did James Collado say, no, you know what, you didn't give me a fair shot? And I'm, I'm, we're making stuff up here, right? But we've got to speculate. You know, you know, if you're, if you're James Collado, do you go, you know what, I've only done five races, right? It hasn't been a proper season. I haven't really had a, I've been, and I've been improving, like, and maybe that was what they asked him to do at the beginning of the season, we don't know, maybe part of his, you know, we want you to just show us at the beginning of the season and get better and improve, and you could argue, you could argue that James Collado was steadily improving, yes, his qualifying pace wasn't great, but his race pace was improving, but his qualifying pace was increasing upon each session, you could argue, so maybe if we had a normal season, James Collado could have got close to Mitch Evans. And, and and you know brought brought that barrier brought the barrier closer so to naturally fight with him next season. Yeah, well, I think already I think we can crown um, James Collado Rookie of the Year. I think unless Nico Muller does a uh, does a spectacular job in Berlin, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else who's Nick a rookie DeFries. on the grid. Nick, De, oh Nick De Vries. Oh, I am I am stupid. How I am you stupid. About I Nick? forgot. No, I just I just. Weirdly thought that he'd like been in the sport for mo- for more than just then. Yeah, um, it does look feel no, that way um, sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, no, because uh, because yeah, he just jumped in and was immediately fast. I was thinking, yeah, no, he's the fastest of the ones 
towards the back of the field. Um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, no, um, yeah, ob- obviously Nick the Freeze. Oh, I really am stupid. But no, um, uh, but no, J- uh, James Collado. I think after Nick the Freeze, it was by far and away being the Rookie of the Year. Um, James Collado has been uh, second. J- James Collado has been there or thereabout. Um, and so yeah, no, I think yeah, I think he has done a good job. Um, I think he, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think he got the season he was expecting. Well, no one got the no one got the season they, that they were expecting. But no, I think uh, I yeah, and he and he has done well. He scored points in Diria. I think he might have snagged a point in Santiago. I can't remember correctly. But um, but no, he but uh, but no, he has done he he he, he has done he has done rather well this season. And and is it enough to warrant him a seat? Next season, kind of, but then again, we saw some superb performances from Alex Lynn in uh, in Jaguar last season, and uh, he didn't get the seat for uh, for this season at Jag. So, so yeah, um, yeah, no, I think James has made the correct decision in terms of going to uh, uh, going to Spa instead of sticking around in Berlin for an extra couple of days. But um, but yeah, um, I think had he give, had he been given a proper season, he would have done. Maybe, maybe even better than normal, but um, we'll have to see what he does in Berlin in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, it is hard. It is definitely hard to sort of like judge James Collado or any of the rookies really until you know we see how what they do and how quickly they they run in in these last couple of races. Because you know, if I was a driver, right? If I was a driver coming into a series, okay, and it's completely new, and I'm not as adaptable as someone else. And I suppose that's your downfall, if you're not as adaptable. And let's say, because, you know, look at Neil Yarny, for example, class driver, fantastic driver, the pedigree, the championships behind him. For what one reason or the other, he hasn't adapted to. Um, And we're going to get onto that story in a moment, actually, of Neil Yarny. Um, But, you know, maybe I'm one of those drivers, but I've shown that each race I've gotten better. And I think James Collado was one of those, right? Probably better at adapting than the likes of Neil Yarny. But, you know, we still had to improve because Mitch Evans, when he came in as a rookie, boom, like one of those drivers, Mitch Evans was like that. Felix Rosenquist was like that. Um, Pascal Verline, as soon as they got in the car, boom, bang. It doesn't matter what car you give me. Nick, yeah, Nick... Nick De Vries, for example, who did come in and, and do a decent job. Obviously, Van Dorn was a tough teammate, um to have for De Vries, but, um, you know, we have to remember that De Vries technically on the road in Santiago got a podium as well, but was penalised through a power spike, which is no fault of his own. So he could have had a podium this year. Um, so, as I said, it, it's, it's very hard to, to look, but that's what I was thinking with Brendan Hartley. I just want to move back to Brendan Hartley slightly. Dragons, obviously, it seems very complicated, right? This dragon story, Ed. Um, but, I didn't think about it at first, that because uh, I, you know, I'm not a WEC, but I, I like WEC. But you know, when when your when your patch is Formula E, you sometimes forget about other motorsport series. Um, and then when I realised that, oh yeah, WEC does collide slightly, not really, but it, the practice session collides with um, Formula E for the final race of the season. I was like, okay, that might be a reason as well that Dragon was like, well, I've got to go here anyway on the 40 or the 14th or whatever it is of August. So I can't do those two races. And Dragon was like, well, your contract's up anyway. And I don't know, do you want to stay? And did it? maybe maybe it's not as frosty as we made out to be. Maybe it was sort of a mutual termination between those two because, you know, it, Brendan is picking up his WEC commitments again and it didn't really work out with Dragon. I don't think many places, drivers at the moment, for whatever reason, are working out with Dragon. Um, so maybe it was more of a mutual termination and sort of like a, well, this is kind of rubbish, I'm just leaving. I definitely think the uncompetitiveness of the Dragon would have played a factor in there, and the fact that Toyota is obviously, I guess, well, I guess they're sort of fighting with all the LMP1 privateers, but they're definitely way, a way much more competitive factory prospect. So it makes sense to bring Hartley from that perspective to focus on, on that. I, I think there was something you said earlier about uh, Tom Bonkus uh, being brought in to um, basically get the reserve driver role for season seven. As far as I know, he's only officially uh, at Jaguar been given that role to replace Lynn, of course, who went to Mahindra, who was the reserve up until very recently. So, uh, but yeah, going back to Dragon, um, I, I, I could see it as literally just being a, a clash and that, but I definitely feel like um, the trend, of, well, the, the, the sort of 
there's definitely uh, there seems to be a, a bit of a trend at Dragon of drivers uh, leaving under uh, mysteriously unexplained circumstances, <laughs> and uh, it seems that Brendan is going to be the latest of those. But Jack, it's actually interesting now. Let's imagine that this was season one, season two, right? You've got Nick De Vries, you've got Sebastian Buemi, Championship leader Antonio Felix da Costa. You know these big names that will be competing in that race in Spa on that weekend. They're now staying with Formula E and missing that practice session. If we go back to season one, season two, I'd be thinking that those drivers would be like, I'm contracted to be at that practice session. And that practice session overrules Formula E because that's a bigger championship than Formula E. Which happened before, which you could argue happened with Boemi um, in season three when he missed his championship. He didn't really want to miss that race. In New York, he, you know, if you ask him, he'll say he didn't really want to miss that race. But he had to because that's what his contract stated. And now these drivers have sort of worked Formula E to say no. Like Sam Bird, fair play to Sam Bird. He said from day one, Formula E comes first. But it wasn't the same with other drivers. And now looking at this situation, with just James Collado seeming to go to WEC to do the practice session. You know, whether or not he has a different motivation to do so is another thing, or it might be just his contract. But it's interesting for me, seeing how far this championship has evolved, that the drivers are saying, you know what, this Formula E race comes before a practice session in WEC, whereas maybe before it wouldn't have. No, I, I was I, I I was genuinely about to touch on the whole season three New York Nurburgring fiasco, where um where Sebastian Buemi effectively lost that championship because he didn't turn up in New York. Admittedly, Lucas didn't have the best weekend, but um and technically you could put it down to Bohemi's crash in Montreal that um actually cost him the championship. But um no, the missing those two races in New York definitely didn't help. And I think had he been there in New York he probably would have won the championship because in that season he did either win the race or score no points whatsoever. So, um, so yeah, I, yeah. So yeah, we, 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 we have seen it. We have seen it in the past before. Um, but yeah, Formula E has really come a long way. We, we would have seen drivers in year in, in, um, in season one, season two, it's been like, yeah, bye bye. I'm off to WEC. Um, but, um, but no, uh, uh, but no. As as as, manfa- as manufacturers have started coming into Formula E as well, I think I, I think that makes it more interesting because the main reason why Buemi couldn't stay in New York is because he uh, is because he was contracted to Toyota, which is one of the biggest global band, brands. Yes, he was racing for um for Renault for Renault Edams, but it was an Edams contract, so he could wiggle his way out of that and that let Pierre Gasly have a go. Um, and he, he he hasn't. I'm, I'm not sure what Pierre's done since. Um, but um, <laughs> but yeah, you just um, lost track of it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it is. It yeah yeah. But people take Formula E more seriously now than they did before. And and uh, and also, like I alluded to earlier, most of the most of the WEC drivers. Um, hang on, I, I had it up earlier. Who are they? Uh, da Costa, Lin, and Boemi are the remaining three, I believe, who are who are um, who. Who are in WEC and Formula E? Uh, Lin- you forgot Nick DeFries again, by the way. No, I forgot Nick. De- it, it's it's not in this article that I've got up here. So in the LMP2, blame, the one with Guido van der Gard. Blame Dan Force Radio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, you don't like Nick DeFries. Have you got someone against Nick no, DeFries? No, I do not have someone. I, I actually really like Nick DeFries. So Mate, we did we did yeah. a nice feature on him in the magazine. Yeah, coming I, up. Love, I love we Nick. Don't, we don't need you now saying you don't I love like Nick. him. <laughs> I love Nick. I just it just wasn't in this article that I'm reading. It didn't say his name. But no, I'd like to apologise to all our friends at Downforce Radio, <laughs> yes. by the way. Yeah. Pico didn't mean it. Yeah, no, yes. I yeah, I, I I love you really, guys. Um, uh, but, but yeah, um, but, uh, but but yeah, most of these guys are at the top of the championship, so they'll be fighting for so so so, so they'll be fighting for the world championship. Apart from Alex Lynn, who is who has already been brought in to replace Pascal Wehrlein, so there's not much he can do there, anyways. So yeah, no, I think the only one who could have disappeared was James Collado, and he has done that accordingly. I think fair play to Alex Lynn, right? Fair play to Alex Lynn because okay, he had a contract, right? He had a contract to race in that race, right? But he's well, he'll probably still go, right? But he's like, you know what? I know I'm gonna miss practice. But I really want to race in this Formula E car, and I really want to race in this series. 
Um, so fair play to him because obviously he's missing a little bit of running on that day to race Formula E. And obviously that shows his commitment, I think, Ed, that, you know, Formula E, you know, is, is an up and coming series and is something that drivers really want to be a part of. Yeah, and Alex Lynn has had to wait pretty much a, a whole year since uh, for, for Jack Gio the uh, season five finale you know, in New York to uh, to finally get a, a chance in Formula E again. And uh, yeah, he's someone who, you know, had shown a lot of potential in Formula E, uh, scoring that you know, pole position on his debut uh, again in that, uh, that same season three race in New York where he was filling in for Jose Maria Lopez at uh, Virgin Racing at the time. Because uh, uh, Lopez and Buemi were the two who basically chose World Endurance over uh, Formula E in that scenario, and um, yeah, so I, I think Lynn had was a bit unlucky at Virgin, uh, and again didn't get the full season at Jaguar. So Mahindra, he sees that as his real opportunity. He's gonna he's gonna go for it like a lot of other drivers. He's gonna skip that uh, first practice at Spa, and Colado is there like the, the pretty much the exception amongst the Formula E field for reasons that we've we've just mentioned. So yeah, d- uh, like you say, fair play to Alex Lynn. Hopefully, he can make the most of his opportunity. Okay, so I want to talk Pascal Verline, boys. I want to talk Pascal Verline. One reason, right? We are now less than a week away from the restart of the season, and Porsche are clearly not using him. Okay, to race in the final races of the season. And now to me, that makes things 10 times more juicy in terms of what has happened, Jack. Because let's put it this way, right? Okay, look, let's put Sam Bird into perspective. Has announced a deal to move away from the team to sign for Jaguar for season seven, but is racing with Virgin for the final six races. Verline, nothing's been announced. We don't know. We have... Hope we we would sound stupid to be honest with you if he doesn't sign and he's not a Porsche driver going into season seven because we're all gonna look unbelievably dumb basically because we've been every publication in the history of publications has been saying you know what Pascal Verlaine he's going to Porsche that's why he's left me injury he's going to Porsche we're going to expect an announcement at some point soon that he's gonna and it's never come it has never come and I find that super interesting that he hasn't come um, Jack what do you think do you think Pascal, uh, Pascal Verline, you know, how, why do you think he's left Mahindra if he's not going to be racing in these final couple of races? Well, you yeah, know, th- thankfully I have read every publication to to have ever existed, and um, and uh, yeah, I did uh, I did see it in Hello and OK magazine, um, but <laughs> but no, um, uh, yeah, it's yeah, I, I yeah, this has been this has been the thing that's like gone around for like the last oh month month and a half or something now that um that. Pascal left Mahindra. He, he he announced it on his social media. Mahindra didn't announce it on uh, didn't didn't do a press release or anything. And then they and and, and then they announced Alex Lynn. Uh, but Porsche do not um, Porsche do not announce Verline yet. So I'm actually thinking that they're going to announce Pascal Verline the day or two. Okay, I, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna give myself a little bit of leeway. The week following the final round of the Berlin um the final round of the Berlin short season. Um yeah, I yeah, I it 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 will be really, really surprising if um if Pascal Verline does not um does not race um in season seven after the whole fiasco of um of leaving Mahindra destined for Porsche and then in the end, no, no, it's just he's just not there. But um, but yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of surprised that they haven't announced him for season seven. But I kind of did always see Johnny finishing off the season, so I'm not surprised that they haven't announced him for the duration of season six. What surprises me though, Ed, is that I just find it crazy. Mahindra are not a team. That seems to, you know, you want to walk out. Everyone seems to love being at Mahindra. And, you know, for whatever reason, Pascal's left. Like, and it is a family team. When you speak to Felix, he loves it there. You know, great passion. Heitfeld obviously loved it there. And, you know, I spoke to Karun Chandok recently. He said he loved his time at Mahindra. And, you know, everyone who's been part of Mahindra seems to have loved their time there. So for, for Verline to, to walk out with six races to go, 
races are, and, and not to say it's because I'm going to race for Porsche in these final six races seems crazy to me because why would he leave and not take part in, in, in a championship let's face it right in a but tra racetrack where Mahindra have done well at and you've got six races potentially at a circuit that Mahindra have done well at and you could pick up some results and you could maybe make I'm not saying he could have won the championship but he could have made a late surge you know if things were put together and, and Pascal Verlain is more of a capable driver of making that late surge so it surprises me and I think it adds a more fuel to the fire about why Pascal Verlain left Ed yeah, I, I feel like um, in the interviews that you did with uh, Dilbert Gill, he, he had sort of, he, he was a bit cagey, obviously, about what had happened in a way that he was, uh, yeah, he said that, you know, there was no breach of contract. So that sort of suggests very much of the relationship. Uh, because it always seemed to me like he was, ne he was very close with Felix, of course, and he had, they had great success with uh, Felix Rosenquist. But I felt like, um, they sort of tried to um, welcome Pascal with open arms and that may not necessarily have been the way things ended up uh, playing out. Uh, I, I don't want to speculate and say, oh, maybe, maybe it's, it's Pascal's fault or it's Mahindra's fault somehow. I, I think it's just one of those things where, you know, the relationship ran its course and I uh, think for whatever reason, uh, things didn't work out. Now, as to why he's, he's left and then just ended up without a seat for the last, uh, you know, five or six rounds of a uh, season six uh I, I i it could just be that it was unintentional that perhaps he expected to um, be announced for porsche for the you know finale of this season and then porsche just, uh, just said well we need to honor our commitment to neil yani and see out his contract to the end of the season because he's one of our you know drivers that we've seen great success with in other series he's someone who's done a lot of testing for us and we want to see out his contract and rather than breaking it and that means you have to wait till season seven pascal that is the way i picture things happening and because he wants that porsche seat so badly he said okay well i'll sit on the sidelines and even though i don't really, I really want to get back to racing but it could just be that with all the coronavirus pandemic stuff it's really put things in, into perspective and that was why Pascal Verlaine has made the move that he has i suspect if you asked him that would be the answer that he would give something a very uh KG. Um. Yeah. No, I agree. But the thing is, for me, what I find really interesting is that, and I just thought about it right now, is he kept mentioning his Ferrari simulator work, Ferrari simulator work. Everything was related back to Ferrari simulator work. I can't do anything right now because I've got some Ferrari simulator work to do. And I wonder if that played any sort of role in it because, you know, from the outside, it looked okay. It looked fine. The relationship looked good. When we're, you know, the race at home championship was going on and Pascal Verlaine was racing for the championship. Dilbert Gill was all there. We wish him the best of luck. We're so happy that he's doing such a great job. You know, me, Pascal Verlaine in interviews, yes, I know he was saying this Ferrari stuff, but at the same time, he was like, I, you know, I really appreciate the team. Team's doing a good job. I'm looking forward to the next couple of races. And then three days later, he's out. Bye. See ya. Ciao. Like, that's why I think it took everybody by surprise because, okay, yes, these rumors have circulated not long after the race at home championship had finished, Jack. But, you know, I just, the, the way he left doesn't make sense. We say not long after the race at home championship. I believe it was something along the lines of 24, 36 hours after the race at home championship had finished that, that, that he said this. And, and, um, and, yeah, he was gone. And I'm pretty sure that's the most someone's ever said Ferrari simulator work in, in a space of 30 seconds. So, nice, God, no, no, nice job there, Jack. Um, but, yeah, no, um, I... I, I, the Pascal Verlain one has always been a little bit confusing to me. I, I, I'm just going to assume that it was kind of the same as what we've now started to speculate over the Dragon thing that the contract ran out, but he had signed for Porsche. So it was just like, yeah, no, nah, I'll just, I'll just miss the race. But I'm surprised that he's missing it because, as you said, um, Mahindra go well at that track. It's a home race for him, and yeah, there is, and 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 there is a chance for him to actually go and fight for I I I'd say the championship but you know P6 but um but yeah I yeah it is it is it, I still I I still find it a bit a bit of a surprise that that he's still kind of done this especially because it's looking evident that he wasn't going to race for Porsche for the final six races of the season but yeah I yeah 
It's an odd one. It is an odd one. But Ed, to finish up, because we've not got too long left, but to finish up, just a quick word. Um, Formula we might be a little bit scared because COVID-19 is creeping up on us. There is a little bit of a second wave happening in Europe, but obviously not too much in Germany, but Germany's cases have began to increase. Now, we're still going, we're going to be in Berlin. I think Formula E will be okay because we'll be in our own little bubble. And I'm, that's, I suppose that's why they've not invited any media because, you know, I'm assuming that they'll be all be traveling to Berlin like now um, to sort of get ready to be tested. So everyone's safe when we go into the event. But whereas if we had media coming in different days, different tests, um, you know, you're sort of, the bubble is sort of not, you know, you'd probably have to travel with the circus if they invited Berlin media, like you'd have to travel at the same time and same sort of with the same people. But cases are beginning to slowly increase. And you never know, by August 15th in the UK, Boris Johnson here said that we could be expecting a second wave in our country by that time. So you never know, that could be hitting Germany at the same time. So, uh, you know, some worry, I think. I've long since uh, stopped taking what Boris Johnson says as gospel, but yeah, it's definitely a real fear. Uh, <laughs> but um, sorry about that. Um, I I think um, it's uh, it, what was worried me is I was looking at countries like uh, Vietnam, South Korea, that had up to now done a very good job of containing the virus. Vietnam, I think, still does hasn't had any deaths there. They haven't had a lot of cases, and like you say, cases have been going up very, very recently. But uh, Viet but Vietnam did a very good job of catching it early enough and being able to sort of prevent anyone from dying and i think there's very real fears that this second wave especially i think it's going to be more of a threat going into the winter but it could very well stroke early into late summer or autumn so you've you got to, i think formerly and other motorsport championships we've seen formula one start up with their triple header recently i've got another one this weekend uh, yeah they, they've they've all done a pretty good job so far i think so we've got to hope for the best I do have a solution to the whole like stay in the bubble and everything, and that is everyone takes a tent to Templehof and then just camps out on the airfield. So if that would work, that would work. But boys, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. No worries, Jack. Right. So just before we wrap up, some interesting things. Magazine. So today's Thursday. So tomorrow our magazine will come out. So. Look out for that on the website. Uh, amazing features with Stoffel Van Dorn. It's a the Stoffel Van Dorn is a must read. Same with Nick DeFries. They are really interesting. We've got a Mercedes special. So head over to the Formula e Zone website if you even if I can say my own publication's name, and um, read the magazine. It is a good one. Also, um, hit the Twitch Twitch link below. We're getting close to 50 followers. So if you haven't followed us on Twitch yet, come and hit the follow button. Um, the Twitch community is popping off. It's getting more amazing as we go. Uh, Discord as well. Um, join the Discord link. The community is growing steadily, which is beautiful to see. And don't remember to, well, actually do remember to hit the like button and the subscribe button on the channel for obviously to help increase the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you soon. Goodbye.